I'm just going to start with a question to Dr. Ellen um, about how how can we bridge the the gap between the the research about housing instability and and the policies that we're um, implementing to bridge that gap and um, and. And also, I'd, I'd love to hear what you think are the highest priority policies for action. Mm -hmm. um, All right, well, the second part is, is, is hard, um, but let me think about that while I'm, okay. I, I, I would sort of put the, um, I, I think that sort of there, there are three types of responses. I mean, the truth is maybe the most important is, is just expanding the supply of, of housing subsidies, right, and ensuring that, um, it's not just one in four families in the United States, um, income eligible families, who are able to receive support for their housing. Um, and uh, as um, I hope I persuaded you this morning, right, we know that we now, I think, have, have uh, strong emerging evidence that housing subsidies really make a difference in, in um, you know, s stabilizing ch families' lives and then helping their children thrive in school. Um, I think, secondly, sort of short of kind of longer term subsidies, I, I think that there is lots that we can do um, and lots that local governments in particular can do to help families stay in their homes um, and remain secure in their homes. And that can be short term financial assistance to help families pay um, back rent. I mean, oftentimes, I mean, it's sort of tragic you see that families end up in homeless shelters because they're just sort of a few hundred dollars behind in their rent, but they can never catch up. Like, that's crazy that we can't intervene and provide those few hundred dollars to, to that family. And again, part of it is finding those families, right? That's part of the challenge. But um, uh, I think there's also, um, you know, we recently in, in New York City have adopted a universal right to counsel in, in housing court, and we're actually in the process of evaluating that, but I think it's, it's likely to show, um, certainly some other researchers shown, that the um, availability of a, of a lawyer, availability of legal assistance, um, can, um, can help families um, negotiate with their landlords and, um, and work out payment plans and, and remain stably housed. And, and I think there's also sort of a set of, of more sort of social services that, um, that can be very helpful to, um, to, to families that are, that are vulnerably housed. And I think um, all of that can really help families and um, stay in their homes and then kids ultimately stay in their schools. Um, I, I would say that um, I, I also think that uh, is a little more general is that, it, as I mentioned, sort of the, the partnerships that we've been talking about, I, I think are really, really, really essential. Um, I think that there are ways that, um, you know, housing providers, homeless, um, you know, uh, home, work, you know, government um, agencies focusing on homelessness prevention, um, should be should be working together. Um, there's one, I was gonna say, there's one, um, Good example in um, in uh, California that uh, Eden Housing, um, which is a wonderful nonprofit and uh, a developer in, in California, has been partnering with uh, the Partnership for Children and Youth. I think I don't know if you know it in, in California, but they have been working with um, to train all of the the um, managers at um, at Eden to help them both um, develop but also enrich their existing um, on-site programs. Importantly, they work with both children and parents, right? So they're working with the families. I think that's the theme that I mean, Carrie talked about. I think that's really, really, we know that that's important. Um, I think also that, that sort of, to the extent that I think on-site programs, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm veering kind of a little bit beyond housing stability here, but um, can, uh, can work with school administrators and teachers to really make sure that their their programs are are complementing the the instructional curriculum. Um, they can, uh, and and I think that there's also, I mean, one of the, um, it's going sort of circling back a little bit more to directly to housing stability and neighborhood stability. Um, I, I talked briefly this morning about the research that I've done showing how much violence. Um, undermines children's exposure to violence, right? This is not participation, this is not being victimized directly, this is sort of just 
living in, in very violent neighborhoods and how that can traumatize children. Um, and we're doing some research now that shows that schools can really help to moderate that. Um, and so it's not, again, we can't ask schools to do everything, right? I mean, you can't, but on the other hand, schools do play an important role. And I think getting inside that black box to really understand, and it sounds like um, the program, Carrie, that you've developed um, could, be, could be very helpful, I think, in helping children sort of overcome um, what's often, you know, the trauma that they're experiencing outside of the, outside of the classroom. So I think that that kind of, whether, you know, whether it's, it's their, their own residential stability or whether it's sort of instability in, in their um, neighborhood environments, and I, th I think that's essential. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to take our first question from the audience, and it's uh, for you, Carrie, and we don't have time for you to do a full ruler training, but folks, uh, folks are interested in hearing um, a little bit more specifically what ruler is, maybe with a concrete example, and also a concrete example of what restorative practice looks like. Oh, I could do a whole restorative circle. <laughs> teaches the five SEL skills to recognize, it's an acronym, so the R, recognize, understand, label, express, and regulate emotion. Um, the four anchor tools um, that Yale teaches um, are first the charter, which I explained a little bit about before. We would invite families in. Um, how do you want to feel when you're at home? What, you will do to feel that way. And then the last piece is when conflicts arise, what, what, what action plan do you have? Um, the second anchor tool is actually the mood meter. Um, and that kind of connects with helping students um, to identify and um, discriminate between their feelings, because there, there is a difference. Um, when you are frustrated, you are not necessarily angry, but they could present very similarly to an educator, for example, in the classroom. Frustration can be misinterpreted as anger. Mm -hmm. um, and students, when they're trying to identify their own feelings, often misidentify how they feel. And the reason why that is so important is because to provide proper interventions, you need to know what the antecedent is. So if I don't understand why a student is demonstrating um, behaviors that make them look like they are angry, and I'm trying to um, build a relationship with that child or de-escalate a situation, I am at an automatic disadvantage. If I can clearly see signs where that child is frustrated, I intervene differently. You would um, look at strengths that the student has. You would have them look at what they do know. You would um, use those strengths to help support whatever they're frustrated about. We could go online and research different ways of looking at a problem, whereas anger would be treated differently. Um, so um, the mood meter has an X axis and a Y axis. And as you go from the bottom of the mood meter to the top, that is showing the increase in energy you have. And when you're moving from the left to the right on the y-axis, that is demonstrating the amount of pleasantness. The farther you go right on the mood meter, I wish I brought my poster, I had it in the car. <laughs> uh, the farther you go right. I can demonstrate that. <laughs> um, the farther you go right on the mood meter, the more pleasant you are. So if um, we had four quadrants in front of us, the top right quadrant would be high pleasantness and high energy. That would be in the yellow. Um, high energy towards the left side, the, um, that quadrant would be red. So um, low energy towards the left would be blue, and the low energy towards the right would be green. So if a child comes in and they say they're feeling in the blue, they are saying that they're lower energy and they're, they're not feeling very pleasant. 
So um, younger students will first just identify with the color as they're learning the different languages, uh, the different language to use to represent their feelings um, more accurately. Um, they would also put uh, a simple words there, like sad. Well, I could be in the blue and not be sad, because sad and when you're depressed, those are very different emotions. Um, so teaching students through the uh, feeling words curriculum that kind of goes along with the mood meter that I just described is um, has shown uh, students really how to properly identify their emotions. And then as teachers, we um, explicitly teach students ways to shift their emotions. Because sometimes it is not optimal to be in um, any particular quadrant. If I needed to sit down and focus on a, a calc test, my extremely high energy yellow, which is my natural personality, um, puts me at a disadvantage. And I need to be able to kind of settle myself down. And um, I'll hear educators say that to students. Well, calm down, calm down. <laughs> and our students want to calm down. They just don't have the skills to do that. So um, the third anchor tool is the meta moment. There are six steps to the meta moment. And um, it's basically sensing what happens. Um, so if I was talking about my morning driving here, I would say I, I was all ready, um, super excited, prepared. I was going to leave so early, grab a coffee locally. Everything was perfect in my head. And um, just about to leave, and I told my husband, you know, hey, honey, I'm about to go. Make sure when you know Logan gets up that you. And he's like, well, where are your keys? Well, I need the keys. Did you move the car seat? Do I have this? And I have. And immediately, I could feel my heart start pounding and my hands start sweating. And I'm like, I don't know where the keys are, honey. You took them out of the, you know. And we started going. And I said, honey, if here are where the keys are. You'll be fine getting Logan to school by yourself. I know you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's teacher appreciation week. <laughs> so he already has his outfit planned. He's his um, teacher sidekick, so he had a Batman shirt all ready to go. Um, so I think just calming myself at that point and my husband down was, was needed. But as an adult, there were a lot of things that happened to get from when I was all worked up and my heart started pounding and my hands were sweating, I, as an adult, knew that I needed to stop and I needed to think about where I wanted to be and then I needed to use strategies or tools that I had been taught for 35 years to help myself regulate my emotions. And that's what the, the um, meta moment does for our students. In that strategy phase, we teach things like um, breathing techniques, stretching, positive self-talk, um, strategies that you help shift from one um, quadrant to another. Um, I'll quickly um, say this one last thing about the mood meter and meta moment. Um, many students think that it's wrong to be in the red, which would be in the high energy, not so pleasant category. And um, many educators also thought, well, you don't, you don't want to be in the red, and you don't want to be in the blue, so you just need to stay in the yellow and green. And that's not really a good thing. When injustices happen, you should be in the red. And, and I feel it's very important to teach students all emotions are important and valid at times, but it's how we use those emotions. So using uh, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, if I said to my students in the second paragraph, plot how Martin Luther King would feel on the mood meter, and they're like, oh, he's red, <laughs> he is red. And I, and I said, is that okay? And they're like, well, no, we, we want him to be happy. I said, yes, we do want him to be happy, but based on what's going on in society, do you understand why he's in the red? 
Yeah. So what, what did he do with that red emotion, that feeling of injustice? He gathered people together, created a movement to make change, and talked to people about how to express their emotions in a positive way. And I think um, teaching adults first um, and informing adults on those um, issues are very important. So we're able to teach our students properly. And, um, and then the last anchor tool, just to jump right into it, is the blueprint. And it's basically um, a very simple strategy for dealing with conflict. Um, it's identifying um, what happened. Um, I used to fall into this trap all the time. I would say, especially teaching middle school, why would you do that? I remember, I think that was probably like one of my go-to phrases, like, why would you do that? And I'm talking in lots of areas, academic instruction and not. Um, and I learned through the ruler approach to say, what happened? Because it's very hard for both my own children in my classroom, and I see it on my visits to schools, it's hard for children to identify why they did something without first thinking about the situation. What occurred? What happened? And then walking through, how did that make you feel? How did that make the other person feel? Um, what could you have done differently to change that outcome? Because then going forward, students are being taught these problem-solving, conflict resolution skills. So when somebody says something extremely inappropriate about their mother, their first reaction isn't to punch them in the face. Because even us adults, there are probably many times where things are said where our first reaction would be to want to punch somebody in the face. That is not an unusual feeling. But that's also not a, a, a productive action. Um. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, I, I, I love the point about Martin Luther King and how, um, you know, I hadn't really thought about how part of what Ruler does is um, help students and families understand the injustices in their lives and sort of use that energy that comes from an injustice to really take action. And I think when we think about how we are gonna solve problems as, a, as opposed to just treat problems, you know, having, empowering people to change their own lives um, is really important, be advocates for themselves is a really important strategy. I really thought about how Ruler has a ro role in doing that. Did you wanna? Yes, you identifying a, the, about ruler that I talked about. I did forget to mention the restorative practice yeah. piece. Um, so restorative practices um, entered into our SEL journey really because uh, out of necessity. And it was also very organic um, because uh, restorative practices really shift from a punitive mindset to a, a more healing approach to what some consider negative behaviors. So um, our, at the district level, our entire student handbook um, was just rewritten um, by 30 plus educators over the course of two years to reflect our restorative mindset where um, everybody has an equal voice and everybody has an opportunity um, to be part of something bigger than themselves and to make, um, to recognize your own impact on other people. Um, a poem that I do um, working with both educators and students called Invitation to Brave Space um, is one of the ways that I utilize um, the restorative circle. When we begin by saying, um, I'm not running this circle. Um, we have guiding questions for us but all the participants of the circle have equal value and equal voice. That means, um, that kind of shakes things up for students because they view uh, school as a hierarchy. And that, you know, first from I listen to what you tell me to do and I'm expected to do it, um, to um, as they go through adolescence where 
you know, you tell me to do something and I tried to do the opposite. Um, and then into high school where you tell me to do something and I ask you how you want it so I can get the A on my paper. Um, and in all of that, ownership is really lost. And I think that's one of, um, one of the things I love about restorative practices and the fact that um, they're really meant to build relationships and when harm is caused, all parties come together and figure out what needs to be done um, to make things better. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna pose this question to Matt um, first to maybe give us his experience on the ground and then follow up with maybe Dr. Ellen telling us what the research says. Um, but what are the um, particular barriers and issues that you are seeing faced by undocumented students when it comes to um, that intersection of education and housing? Well, I think there's a lot to that. I think the, the first thing that comes to mind um, to me is it's a, it's a population uh, that does not typically um, feel as comfortable communicating their needs to society because of their undocumented status. So um, I think when I look at, at the, the Stanford community, we're very blessed to have an organization um, building one community that is, is doing that specific work to be able to connect with the undocumented and, and new arrival population. So I think in, from that standpoint, community-based organizations are better, better positioned than the school system to be able to connect with the families to create that level of trust and to be able to make that connection with their, really their neighborhood to be able to identify the problems so that decisions can be made around what resources to be able to provide them. So it, it, to me, it starts with trust and it starts with um, outreach to be able to connect with them and, and understand that there are caring people who are not looking to, um, to send them away, but actually looking to be able to connect their children to services and resources. And, and given the climate um, in that area over the last two years, I think it's only become a, a, a greater challenge to be honest, um, and uh, looking really last year with, with the way that the, the climate was driven from uh, the, the presidential campaign and, and some of the rhetoric that was out there, uh, there was a lot of anxiety among students that we, f we saw with our um, mentoring program. And not just the students themselves who were were aware of an undocumented status for themselves or a parent, but their friends. I think we had a, a quote that um, came from one of our young girls. It was like, I don't want to see my friend go back to, to Mexico. And it was really um, resonated with us. So I think uh, getting back to to uh, the original question, you know, where does it start? For me, it's, it's us as a community investing in building that trust with that population. Thanks, Matt. Dr. Allen? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree completely with everything that Matt just said. I, I mean, I would just underscore, add a few things. Um, one is that, um, obviously, the undocumented have no access to the, the federal housing subsidies, right, that I've been talking about. Um, they are generally living in, often living in substandard housing. They're certainly living in private housing. And um, to be clear, there are lots of wonderful landlords out there. Um, but there are also some not so great landlords. And um, one of the things we're sort of trying to do now in New York is really to sort of understand what predicts um, people's willingness to report problems and report issues. And, um, and I think undocumented status is, is, is a big part of that. Um, and it is uh, unfortunately an increasingly big part of that given, given the climate. Um, and, and I think one of the things that, um, is really troubling also is just sort of the, the, um, the lack of a safety net for, um, for families who, you know, who, who are evicted. I mean, one of the things that was really tragic is after Superstorm Sandy in New York, um, you know, there was, there were, you know, a whole number of, of families who were undocumented, who were, 
who were um, you know, forced out of, their, out of their homes and they were living in illegal situations. They didn't have leases. They had absolutely no recourse to, to get help from FEMA. And so it's, it's kind of thing that, you know, when things are kind of going okay, it's, it's all right, but it's sort of those bumps in the road are, are, are that much more difficult. Um, and, I, you know, I would say that the, the last thing I just say is just in terms of communities and, and, um, and violence, I think this is um, one area where um, developing that trust, right, is absolutely essential. And I think there's sort of, you know, a lot of law enforcement officials who are um, very concerned about sort of the, the crackdown on, um, on undocumented uh, uh, populations um, because they feel like now they, they have lost a, a source of, of a really important information ch communications channel and, and, uh, and uh, they feel like it's really undermined the trust that is, that is so essential to their ability to, to, to help to partner with communities to keep them safe. Carrie, did you want to jump in on that? I, um, I did want to add that I have found very um, similar um, effects that our undocumented students are facing that our homeless students face. Mm -hmm. um, that fear and that lack of trust um, is very similar. Mm -hmm. um, one of our partners, um, the Bridgeport Child Advocacy Coalition, um, has done tremendous work with our school system and they're gonna be spearheading our next three to five years um, with our SEL movement. And I think one of the reasons why um, BCAC taking over um, as our kind of head agency, why it was so vitally important is because of what Matt said. Uh, Community-based organizations are just more well-equipped to deal with um, undocumented students, students that are struggling with homelessness. And um, because of BCAC's partnership with the Bridgeport Public Schools, we create that trust together, um, with educators along with our community partners. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we have just a couple of minutes left. I'm gonna ask um, one last question, just let you each um, speak to it. Um, I'm gonna, it's a big question, but um, at, what do you see as the relationship between hunger, housing, and uh, child welfare, and, and how that is affecting education? Um, there was another question that was talking about how do we justify the um, opportunity cost of a housing subsidy? And so I think these two questions are sort of tied together when we are struggle, when we see families struggling with several different issues, um, where do we start? Well, I'm just gonna just very quickly just say one thing, which is just there, um, you know, when families receive housing subsidies, um, they, they have more money than available to spend on food and it and there's sort of strong evidence showing that families with housing subsidies renters with housing subsidies right are able to spend more money on food and to um, for for their children and so that's um, you know I, I don't think it's I don't think it's an opportunity cost there I think that receiving a housing subsidy enables a, a family to, to you know buy and spend more money on healthy and nutritious food thank you Carrie um, the Green Village Initiative has partnered with the Social Emotional Learning District team to help teach about the importance of um, eating healthy. And also um, they have 23 community school-based gardens. And we just wrote another $25,000 grant to help expand their program. They work closely with uh, Sacred Heart University in developing a curriculum that connects social emotional learning with literacy and science standards to promote um, healthy eating habits and really bring in the community members um, into these school gardens to take ownership and work together. They had green salad days and other fun initiatives. So once again, I think the key to tackling those challenges is really the connectivity between these various organizations um, with the school system. Yeah, breaking down the silos. Yeah, Matt? Yeah, I, so, 
sorry. Uh, yeah, I think um, you touched on kind of that, that dis more access to disposable income and, and some of the food and quality uh, inequality that exists in the school. And I think the quality of our free reduce lunch program is also right up there with, with something that needs to stay um, top of mind and that it's not just a access to a free reduced lunch, but it's one that's actually uh, something the students want to eat and, and something that is actually providing the nutrients that are going to allow them to sit and listen and, and, and not doze off and fall asleep. We, we hear a lot of those concerns from, from teachers. It's not just putting something in front of a kid and, oh, well, it was free. It's like, well, it was something that they hated and they didn't eat it, so now they're, they're starving, so I keep snacks in my desk. Can I, um, just, I just want to jump in on one thing, and I forgot to say one thing, is that we actually have good research on the um, benefits of, uh, you know, it, there are some schools that in New York that started providing a, a breakfast program for, for kids, and um, it had a direct impact and a large impact on, on those um, kids learning and test scores. And, and, and I think we've also seen um, that it, it is an important part of a family budget for low-income families, and, you know, and where you see the evidence of that is when you have um, I know Bridgeport schools were closed for like a week when there was a terrible storm a couple years ago, and, and families suddenly had to find two meals a day, five days a week for students. Um, you know, they had to find the income to provide those meals when they um, otherwise wouldn't have. So it, it's an important part of that uh, budget process, really, to put those, knit those things together. Um, and I just, I wanted to share just one other story from my work at the Community Foundation about that, um, that opportunity cost. Um, we worked with an organization that uh, was providing some foundational services to families um, to stabilize them. They were at risk of being DCF involved, Department of Children and Families involved, or were. And when they did a follow-up six months later to see how those families were continuing to do, the only families that had become DCF involved again were families who had lost their housing. So I, I think it just speaks to what an important foundation housing is for everything else that a family wants to achieve. So I just wanted to ask you to join, my, uh, join me in thanking our panelists for a great conversation. <laughs> And Joan, it's going to come back up. I would just like to uh, take a minute and, uh, and thank uh, Nancy and Ingrid and Carrie and Matt for doing such a great job uh, offering us such thoughtful examples of things that work, uh, which, you know, we, it, it's so daunting to stop and think about the realities of uh, the families that we're trying to help. and. And, and how different their lives are from our lives. Um, and I always like ending on a note of what can we do? You know, like what's our action plan gonna be? So I heard lots of good ideas today and I'm looking forward to figuring out how we can continue to strategically partner with um, you know, all, of the, all of the good actors uh, in Connecticut. And so I just say, Thank you. Let's feel hopeful and and let's uh, let's get it. Carrie, what was that zone? That's high energy and and happy. Yellow. yellow. Let's get let's let's get into the yellow and stay in the yellow in this.